Good morning, and thanks everyone for joining Teradata's LinkedIn Live. I am Chris Tugood, uh, SVP of Global Marketing here at Teradata, and welcome to the 2021 Tech Predictions. I'll be moderating this live discussion with experts from Teradata. We're here with Hillary, Shri, Cheryl, and Bonnie. Can each of you just take a minute and uh, introduce yourselves? Uh, let's go ahead and let's start with uh, Hillary. Hillary? Hi, thanks, Chris, and thanks everybody for joining us. I'm Hillary Ashton. I'm our Chief Product Officer here at Teradata. I come from a background in data and analytics. Um, I spent 11 years at the SAS Institute focused on data and analytics, and most recently was the EVP of the Augmented Reality Business Unit at PTC, which has some really interesting data and analytics as well. Um, I'm thrilled to be at Teradata, driving our cloud-first uh, product, and uh, excited to be on this panel here today. Thanks, Chris. All right, thanks, Hillary. Sri, how about you? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chris. My name is Sri Raghavan. I'm part of the Data Science and Advanced Analytics Product Marketing Group. Uh, my career has also been in analytics uh, for the past 20 plus years. I've worked in different industries, including healthcare, um, uh, financial services, uh, and now technology. It's great to be here and great to be part of a panel with such distinguished people that I share the stage with. Hey, Sri, no sucking up, but uh, good, uh, good introduction. <laughs> How about you, Cheryl? Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Cheryl Weeb here in uh, sunny California. I run a consulting practice that builds and delivers business analytics solutions across a whole bunch of different industry verticals, although I uh, find myself most at home in industrial methods, um, supply chain, manufacturing. Pleased to be here to talk about 2021. <laughs> Will this right. ever be over? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 2020, we definitely want to be over. All right, and last but not least, how about you, Bonnie? Hi, yes. Um, people that know me know that I have a PhD in artificial intelligence, and I've spent my career correlating disparate sets of big data for actionable results. Right now, I have the privilege of serving as a leader for the practice uh, for data science in the Americas. So. I have the ability to work every day with some of the best data scientists on the planet as they deliver value for our clients from Chile to Canada, helping businesses grow and improving how people live. All right, great. Well, thanks everybody and, and welcome uh, to the panel. Uh, for those that are attending, you know, during this session, you can submit questions via the live chat on the right side of your screen. So during the session. If any thoughts come up or any questions that you have for our panelists, please make sure you enter them there and I will bring them uh, up to our panelists. We will be covering four key areas today. We're going to start out with COVID, then we'll go into data analytics, specifically, specifically drill into some core things around uh, AI and obviously artificial intelligence, and then cloud. And during each of those sessions, we'll get some of the predictions from our panelists, and I'll also bring in some of your questions. And then at the end, we'll do a rapid fire, a single statement from each of our panelists about a prediction that we did not uh, get into. So let's go ahead and jump straight into this. So we all know that COVID-19 has impacted everybody's lives uh, around the world. Uh, in 2020. And, and certainly, it's also accelerated a lot of digital transformation for businesses. Do we think that this impact will continue in 2021? Hillary, what are some of your thoughts about the COVID impact and, you know, specifically on how companies are thinking about coming back to work? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Chris. I think um, what we're seeing at Teradata and with uh, many, many of our customers is that um, the, the uh, COVID pandemic has radically changed um, how we work and how we think about work. And I think it's here to stay. So it's disrupted and really accelerated some of the how we work mentality um, across businesses. Um, and, and there's some interesting aspects of that. We have done a, a number of studies internally uh, with our teams and we have actually seen a curious result, which is productivity, especially on the engineering side, has increased significantly during this work from home period. Coincidentally, or perhaps not, we have seen a tremendous um, um, challenge around work 
work-life balance. Uh, we were just talking about it actually before we came on live. Um, some new uh, uh, Outlook results that, that are sent to you automatically and talk about how much time you're spending on email and on Teams calls or WebEx calls. And so uh, those, those fundamentals, I think, are here to stay. I think that technology um, has radically evolved. If we think back to what a conference call was like five years ago, no video, right? We weren't on video. We, we didn't have any of um, the kinds of capabilities that we have today. Um, and so I think that those shifts will continue. I think we will come back to an office environment. It'll be very, very different. We see companies uh, in the tech sector, especially making investments in alternative locations and different location strategies. That is a long term play. And I think technology will continue to evolve and support um, remote teams. Um, uh, the global nature of our work means that we have teams across the world working together. And so I think this work from home um, uh, shift will only accelerate and continue, not just in 2021, but well beyond. And I don't think that, that we're ever going back to nine to five in an office, 100% of the workforce. So that's my yep. view. I see some some head noddings on the on the uh, on the panel here too. So back to you, Chris. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good, Hillary. So you you say that there's some increase in productivity. You think that a lot of the things that we evolved ourselves towards are here to stay and we'll make it for the better. And you've certainly mm -hmm. seen good productivity in engineering. That's now, right. We just got to fix the work-life balance. We can't have people burning out. So we got to fix no, that. True. Yeah. Now, also something that might help is a vaccine, right? So I know, Shri, you certainly got some perspectives on, you know, the vaccine and how effective it might be and how we're going to roll this out. Can you give us some of your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the thought is actually rolled into what Hillary said, right? There is clearly um, increase in productivity and a lot of people are actually increasing their work from home footprint. But I also think that that is also accompanied by certain degradations in mental health because you're consistently in your own pod in an isolated environment. So I think there's a lot of irrational exuberance about this vaccine. People actually think, hey, I've got a vaccine that's now available to me, therefore I can take it. And now it's just a matter of fact for me to, it's a matter of time for me to get to work. But I think it's a lot more complicated than that because it's just not the availability of the vaccine that we need to be concerned about, which is there of course, and that's one big thing that uh, is out of the way. But what about the distribution? What about figuring out the efficacy of the vaccine amongst different populations? You have many different subpopulations that are going to react differently to how the vaccine is working with their general physiologies. So these are all things that need to be looked at, right? And I think for the most part, people react to the availability of vaccine and, and say, look, by March, I'm going to be back in my office. I'm going to be hanging out with my colleagues. I'm going to be doing a lot of collaborative work, which I would wish for as well. But I think we need to be realistic in the sense that it's going to be at least another six to eight months before we actually figure out the logistics. If we're lucky of how it's being administered, figuring out the efficacy of the vaccines. Remember, most of the time vaccines don't work the very first time it's administered. You need to have at least two shots, even with the existing version. So which means we need to figure out how to be able to look at how this vaccine morphs into more being more um, uh, effective with a large number of constituents. These are the kinds of things I think which is going to be looked at furthermore in 2021, which is going to then impact our ability to return to some semblance of normalcy uh, that uh, we we define as being normal. Well, and Shri, clearly how the vaccine gets rolled out. I mean, data and analytics will pay, play a big role in how effective is this, you know, working, you know, how is it working in different populations? You know, Bonnie, how do you see kind of data analytics as a core foundation really helping us think about how we roll out these vaccines. Any thoughts? Well, right, well, and I think that that's, it's essential in everything that we do. Pretty early on, we developed a COVID resiliency dashboard, both for ourselves and for our clients. And there were a lot of dashboards rolling out, but this one was unique in my mind because it integrated both the health information as well as the mobility information, who's willing to go where, and it integrated also with internal company data. So we were using locations of our offices and locations of our employees to anticipate who might be exposed in their home county or if they came into an office. But I, I think we're gonna hear about more of that later. The other thing that it brought up a lot, and Cheryl is working on this every day, is connect supply chains. 
logistics just became exponentially more important in 2020. And I don't know if, Cheryl, you want to comment on that now or? Yeah, that's right. I mean, we had all hoped that our supply chains were built with resilience and uh, resiliency in mind. But I think, you know, what is what we learned is that we kind of over rotated in the sort of narrow lean principle that is, you know, like you can be uh, too skinny on your supply chain inventory. So uh, 2021 is going to be recovering from that narrow optimization. And I think we've also seen um, how important it is to collaborate in data war rooms and do scenario planning to account for some of the variability. We're still in the third and second and third waves of uh, the pandemic, seeing that we haven't quite figured out um, the variability that we need to cover to deliver predictable service levels uh, in the supply chains. We're seeing again and again uh, more hoarding and more uh, supply chain disruption. So, that that those are some of the the things we've seen, and it's all due to it's all underscoring the importance of uh, data and analytics. I think those are both you know very interesting points. I mean, the resiliency dashboard really helped our you know our customers start to think about the implications of going back to work, and then obviously. A lot of our customers use uh, data and analytics to be able to uncover and be more lean in their supply chain, right? And build more resiliency in the supply chain. It, it's interesting, one of the comments that's going on in the chat is this idea about, uh, will Teradata continue to give you know, free training? I mean, one of the things that we did uh, from a Teradata perspective when we went out with COVID is we just said, look, you know, everybody is working from home. Here's free training. We got people to leverage and understand how to leverage and use uh, that technology. And so we're going to continue to look for ways that we can encourage uh, people to leverage uh, you know, our technology to continue to drive you know, data and analytics. Do you guys think, you know, kind of as a group discussion, that uh, data analytics from our customers is, has been accelerated because of COVID-19? I think so, 100%. And you know, there was some really good work being done by David King and some other people in our retail group on buy online, pick up store. And he delivered a really powerful message with the Marketing Science Institute in conjunction with Dr. Barbara Kahn, who literally wrote the book on retail analytics from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, talking about the importance of analytics as supply chains were changing, as new, um, ways of delivering all of a sudden fell into place. I mean, I've been ordering my groceries online for years and I was mostly upset in March at all the other people who were joining me doing that. I was used to really quick delivery and there were other people getting in the queue. Hillary, you're laughing at that. So you I must am. have had the same I, I'm with you on that. As a working yeah. mom, yeah, I'm totally exactly. down. Right. Yeah, yeah, Hillary's right. like, I used to get preferential treatment and now I'm back at the back of the bus. <laughs> I, I know. I just moved to San Diego. I think the algorithm is working against me. I think if anything, we're all learning the game theory of how to um, work the cues, working work the BOPUS game that it is. And it's different depending on which uh, store you're you're working uh, on getting your groceries from. Uh, one of the things that just to extend on the uh, retail work that we've done that Bonnie mentioned um, and back to how we work and conduct business a little differently, you know, we embarked on, on some pilots with customers that really required us to be there and present to collect what's our ground truth if we're gonna model for how we remake processes and we found we, we had to start working with simulated data. So we actually, this was kind of the mother of invention because we could not be at our customers' retail locations or their research center. We had to like design uh, scenarios where we could place our ground truth and create our uh, predictive models based on simulated data. So that's becoming a really important new way to feed our AI um, that, that actually turns out to be much more uh, cost effective than, than putting stuff out there and placing people with clipboards and doing time and motion studies. Now you can capture that ground truth in different ways. Well, yeah, we did that extensive, oh, sorry. Yeah, I think that's no, interesting, Carol, and it kind of moves us into you know our next category, which is this you know this whole foundation about data analytics, as we just talked about, really accelerating in in 2021 as part of the whole digital you know transformation. What I want to kind of talk about now is what are some of the areas that companies are looking to or 
really need to consider in, in 2021. I know, Sri, you've got some perspective about, you know, being able to do data on all the analytics and leverage collaboration across different skills. You want to yeah. make some comments on that? Yeah, uh, two points I want to make. One is actually I want to piggyback on the previous question around uh, code and analytics because I think that's a very important question. I loved um, Cheryl's um, mother of invention comment because the first thing I remember was Frank Zappa's organ, uh, a group, the Mothers of Invention, which is a fantastic music group, by the way. But anyway, <laughs> um, on, a, on a different uh, a note, right? The COVID has created an existentialist crisis for a lot of organizations, particularly in retail, right? I mean, these days I spend a lot of time in the mall, given the fact that it's Christmas and I have a 10-year-old daughter um, who wants to do after-school shopping. And we find a lot of retailers have, are slowly disappearing or reduce their foot footprints. So existentialism brings a lot of analytic needs. How do I leverage existing data about my customers, about my prospects, about the different geographies to be able to expand my footprint and to survive? That's become a primary need. But in terms of the larger trend that I see in 2021 is a greater sense of collaboration. And what I mean by that is not long gone are the days where now uh, you know, where analytics was done by the privileged few or the qualified few, meaning these are the folks who knew how to program. These are, you know, hard um, core uh, data engineers and so on. Now the entire organization needs to be data driven, number one. Number two, they all need to be data driven with one holistic platform from which they're working, meaning they have to speak the same language. They have to have one single pane of truth, meaning the data. They have to be able to communicate the analytics among different kinds of qualified professionals. These are people who are, you know, some people know exactly what XG Boost means in terms of data science. There are other people who know the business very well, but couldn't give two hoots about what um, XG Boost means or different languages, so which means how do we communicate? So bringing them all together into this one holistic umbrella where each one of them talks to each other fluidly in the cost of advancing a particular business outcome or addressing a set of challenges to me, is one of the big things we're going to see extensively in 2021. And yeah, so Sri, really bringing all of that, you know, data together in a in a way, and then ensuring that people have access to the data to become data driven, but are not limited by their you know specific skill sets. You Absolutely. know, Bonnie, you've got some interesting perspectives also on, you know, how do we integrate all of this data with some foundation around predictable costs and reliable performance and real-time visibility. Any thoughts around that, Bonnie? Absolutely. The people we saw with the highest performance and the best growth during COVID were the people who had already integrated their data environments because you need to have 100% data integration. You you know, there are classic examples of people shopping for something, saying they one in stock at the local store and then getting ready to purchase it because they're buying it online and the online system wasn't integrated with the store inventory and they get a message back saying, although it's in in stock at your local store, we'll ship it there in 18 days and you can pick it up then. That's crazy. The, the best in breed already have integration there. And more importantly, it's important to be able to do that in an environment where you can predict what your costs are going to be, where you can have reliable performance and real-time visibility into all of this data at once. And the, the best players are doing that and they're succeeding very well. And people who haven't done that are getting a chance to play catch up very fast. Yeah, so you think that in 2021, this competition will drive more people to say, look, in companies, we've got to integrate that data and get that complete visibility across it in order to compete. Yes, absolutely. As Shri said, it's an ex existential crisis for these organizations. Have to do it. The other thing that by no stretch of the imagination is a significant change is 5G. You know, Hillary, what do you think uh, about 5G and the impact that will have on, on data analytics? Yeah, it's, um, I'm going to answer that in one second. I just want to go back to the impact of COVID and just mention, because there are probably some folks listening who are aware of this, and we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that COVID has massively disrupted um, our customers with their, with their gold models, right? So the models that worked so well and that were... Um, in production and um, bang on, highly predictive, blah, 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 blah. Um, COVID massively changed that. And so the just like the supply chain, so I can go get toilet paper or whatever, the supply chain to have 
um, highly predictive results was also disrupted from a model standpoint. And so the, I just want to call that out. We could maybe there, some of the data scientists on the phone here or on the line here can maybe talk a little bit more about that. But I do think that is a substantial shift. Mm. It's going to make our customers more agile in how they use data and analytics and how they evolve their model strategy. But it is massively disruptive, right? So I'll, I'll leave that out there for maybe somebody smarter on the phone um, to, to comment on. In terms of 5G, um, uh, certainly uh, 5G is um, super exciting for telco, right? Because it's a, it's a new line of business for them effectively that they can take to market and be very successful with. We've seen that already. Um, but the value of 5G from a data and analytics standpoint um, obviously, IoT comes to mind, you know, across um, manufacturing. And so the notion that you um, can now con have smart connected factories um, using 5G, because a lot of times these factories are out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by nothing, or they're in a basement, or they're in an aircraft carrier, or something like that. So 5G massively opens the door for better IoT um, in hard to get to places for places that are maybe a little bit newer to data and analytics compared to finished versus telco and, and you know more recently retail. Um, also healthcare, I think 5G, especially in environments where machines are in noisy, um, noisy wireless um, locations, 5G is gonna clean some of that up and provide um, smarter um, machines in, again, basements of hospitals and, and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, finally, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to um, augmented reality and the ability that 5G brings, especially in the industrial use cases. Gaming, of course, super awesome. My kids are super psyched about that. But from a manufacturing standpoint, the idea that you can take these very complex polygons um, used through computer vision and um, leverage 5G to both pull and push data faster and more effectively into devices that you know don't have, don't have as much storage um, and processing power um, is a tremendous um, value. So I know I whipped through those super fast. We could probably have a whole conversation around um, some of those topics, but um, those are some of the areas where I think 5G is going to make a substantial changes in manufacturing, retail, healthcare, as three of the, um, in addition to telco, um, and in smart and connected things, systems of things, and systems of systems of things, um, with maybe a shout out to my AR friends out there. Well, and, yeah, and if you look and at that too, be. just if you look at that real quick, uh, Hillary, the, the core foundation of all of that innovation and using that amazing bandwidth is just the amount of data that's going to be generated and all the behavioral kinds of analytics about what's working, what's not working, how to build out and roll out a 5G. So it's going to have huge impact in uh, 2021. Cheryl, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I'm super excited, obviously, too, about uh, bigger, fatter pipes coming at us. But you know, it's it's going to just place that much more um, pressure on these convergence challenges that we always had there between operations technologies and the PLC networks that are running at these air-gapped factories. Just because we have a big fat pipe to connect them with, now we've got these huge cybersecurity challenges. Um, we saw this movie back in the 2014, 15, 16, when, oh, IoT and all these use cases that the telcos will be able to deliver, they still have to now, they have to now speak four plus languages, all the standards bodies mm -hmm. work through these translation issues. And so the 5G network operators actually are going to benefit in initially themselves from much better coverage to their, to the consumer users. But when it comes to enterprises, there's going to be, you know, not to dampen all the excitement or anything, there's going to be a lot of challenges around, you know, translating those operational issues with, you know, with the, the 5G um, super connectivity. Yeah, so good news is we have a lot more data. Challenging news is, okay, how do we ingest that? How do we ingest it at rapid speed? How do we make it available for analytics? And how do we protect it? Right. Which brings to uh, the point um, I was going to bring up uh, earlier, which is um, we may have treated our data and analytics as a, a great asset, but we now have a more increased re dependence on what we call translators, you know, people who can translate the language of mm -hmm. governance and ethics and um, regulatory concerns to operational technology, to information technology and open source, you know, all of these are very different domains. And so I think we, we actually rely even more on a bit of um, humanities uh, education to bring our, that kind of social uh, engineering skill to, to bear. And it gets into what Sri was talking about around skills and collaboration and sharing. 
Hey, there's a question that came in uh, from the audience. It says, what kinds of jobs, you know, based upon all this you guys are talking about, will be trending in 2021 around data and analytics? Shri, you got any thoughts about that? What do you see kind of the job market in this space? What are people going to be yeah, hiring? I think, um, you know, Cheryl um, spoke about a job. I think one of the biggest jobs, I don't know what it's going to be called with a fancy title and whatnot, but translator, um, I think is going to be one of the most important jobs um, that's going to, that we're going to see in the next uh, couple of years, if not 2021, at least at some point in time in the 2021, then eventually increasing. And the reason for that is is precisely because you do have multiple organizations which have a stake in addressing the business challenge. It's not just the, the ability to manage, you know, all kinds of complex technologies and programming languages and what have you, but it's the ability to, how do you synthesize that with uh, regulatory requirements? I mean, for folks who are in the healthcare and financial services place, I don't have to tell you how much regulation you deal with on a regular basis, particularly as this pandemic has raged on. Um, so we need to bring those folks into the conversation, but they don't fully understand, you know, what it means to create a data frame in Python, but should they pay a price for it? Should we make them pay a price for it? So th that's why this translator uh, role, I think is one of the most extremely important roles that we're gonna see in organizations uh, that we deal with on a regular basis at Teradata, but also across the ecosystem that is going to be one big uh, uh, occupation. Well, because we have to drive data liter literacy, right? And translators can help us do that. All right, good. Hey, let's move into our third topic, which is uh, AI. I mean, we've seen a lot of mixed results, right, with AI. What do we think that uh, 2021 uh, will bring with AI? You know, let's start with Cheryl. You know, you've got some predictions around vision AI and you know, natural language processing and other, you know, task-based AI. You want to talk about your views of AI? Yeah, I mean, I think I have a bit of a controversial or skeptical view of AI in the sense of, you know, the Christopher Mims famously had this Wall Street Journal article in which he called the AI this magic sauce you could pour over everything and suddenly we have this sort of back to the future robot who can, you know, improve business processes. For me, I, I, I like I subscribe to a much more, you know, realistic um, position in AI being something, you know, your your uh, your five year old child can do in about 15 seconds, but they can do it at scale and very, very uh, quickly and automatically and accurately. So when when we look at how we're going to be using AI a lot this coming year, it's to to translate the observations from the outside world into structured data that we can can integrate with other uh, sorts of enterprise data. So this is sort of the thing that we're doing uh, in retail and in other um, consumer um, collaborative face-to-face uh, -face environments where we're filling in the, the blind spots that we don't have and we don't want to be spending time with clipboards redesigning processes. In 2021, we'll want to remake our processes and how do we observe what the processes are today so we can alert and and understand and, and intervene in, in when there's something going wrong. It's it's using task AI to fill in those observational real world gaps. Well, Sri, you said AI is going mainstream. It sounds like Cheryl's thinking it's gonna be more task and very focused on specific processes. Yeah, let's get in a little bit of a battle here. Is it gonna be uh, mainstream I, I, or is Cheryl right? Yeah, um, well, of course I'm right. Um, <laughs> But um, I, I certainly think um, it's going mainstream. I think we're going to be talking about AI beyond things like chatbots and so on. I think you've started to hear a lot of conversations, particularly in healthcare organizations about things like precision medicine. Um, when I used to be part of a very large pharma company, one of the things we worked on, on the analytic side is to figure out things like, you know, how do I structure different kinds of treatment regimens for patients who, who have cancer? Now, the unfortunate thing about cancer is that not everyone gets afflicted in the same way, um, you know, because your demographics play a picture into your diet, your personal lifestyle. All those things have a have a big part to it, right? With AI, I believe next year um, and, and further beyond, a lot of this technologies is going to be moving into the mainstream, meaning now organizations, pharma companies are going to be in a position to be able to figure out, hey, for people who are within a certain age group, with this kind of lifestyle, um, with these kinds of cancers um, and other factors, 
these are the kinds of supportive drugs and chemo and radiation that we need to give. And that's going to be tailored according to people and persona rather than this scattershot one um, size fits all treatment that sometimes you've seen in the past, although that's evolving as well. So I think it is going to move into the mainstream. Healthcare is just one example. We've seen, um, in fact, uh, Cheryl has been part of some fantastic work within the company around uh, uh, vision AI. Um, that's moving uh, into the mainstream. So we're going to see a lot more of those impactful cases, significantly more so in uh, the next year and, and beyond. Hey, Bonnie, what do you what do you think? We heard you know Cheryl talk about retail. We heard Sri talk about healthcare. Are there other industries? Uh, you're out there working with a lot of different industries that are really adopting AI or will probably adopt AI in 2021. What are your thoughts, Bonnie? Right, and you know, using Cheryl's metaphor about it's AI is not a secret sauce. I think of it more as intellectual power tools that we bring to bear on problems. Um, there was a time when there weren't grammar checkers and everything that you wrote. But now you've got that intellectual power tool that helps you do what you do best, think the original thoughts, but communicate them in a, in a way that's very uh, understandable from a grammar perspective. So, yeah, we're working all across with different industries. We're certainly working in manufacturing. We're working with healthcare to uh, determine for payers what part of the population might be able to um, benefit from a certain kind of treatment. Uh, Dr. Ram Sahu on my team is working with drug discovery companies and predicting the efficacy of drugs before you go to the labor and expense of building it in the lab and try putting it through trials. So it's really across the board. You know, you know I, think it's, uh, I think that's I think that's really great. And it is it is impacting a lot of different industries. I mean, one of the questions that came in that I want to address to you, Hillary, is what about bias, though? Right. I mean, a lot of people really think about well, you can put AI, but you can build in bias to kind of get your results out of it. I mean, what do you think, Hillary, about bias and how do we think about, you know, addressing that so it becomes more unbiased? Any thoughts? Yeah, so I, I think the answer with that lies with the humans who are um, deciding, making the conscious decisions of what, what, um, what data we're going to train um, AI models on, um, what we limit, um, uh, in terms of uh, allowing uh, new data to enter into the system and make new decisions based on that data, right? So if you have a, a remote um, uh, AI module and it's only getting a reinforced bias set of data, you can't permit that. And as humans, you've got to make the decision to not, even though it could solve a problem, it's gonna create another one and the bias problem outweighs the, the the good, the benefit, right? And so I think we have to be, the problem with technology is, is sometimes you have really great technologists who are just unbelievably awesome at applying technology. And so you ask the question about what jobs are going to become more important in the future. And I think um, data, based ethicists are going to be a critical job mm. function. Again, fancy title, back to Shri's like, kind of statement, like not sure what we're gonna call them exactly, different people have different flavors of that title, but the decision on how you're going to use data, analytics, and machine learning and AI um, ethically as a company, in the same way that we have a rich um, history of, of companies making unethical decisions over time, data and analytics and AI is going to be the next frontier of addressing um, that challenge. So I, I am definitely concerned, um, but technology forever has had, back to you, to the dawn of factories, has had ethical problems attached to it. Yeah. And it's up to the humans to make um, intelligent decisions and put guardrails in place to protect um, the greater good. And I, I believe yeah. humans will continue to do that. Shri, yeah. did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I'd recommend um, a couple of things. One is um, I, I fully agree with you, Hillary. The uh, the one part of the the ethical concern that I see more and more of is privacy. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the AI conclusions um, are based on data that have been collected, for instance, without permissions, without oversight, without endorsements, and so on. And and that's continuing, right? The conclusions that come out of that is absolutely fantastic. But how we actually came to the conclusions is uh, based on data that should never have been collected in the first place. Um, uh, my colleague Martin Wilcox wrote this fantastic piece, um, a blog uh, on this not too long ago, which spoke precisely to that, right? I mean, do we want to live in that kind of a police state, even though the conclusions are are, are going to be great? The, the other 
other thing um, that I want to recommend for those of you who want to Google, there's a great program that I saw on one of the TV networks. I think it was Al Jazeera. I don't remember. It's called Trust Me, I'm an Algorithm. And I think mm -hmm. it was uh, over four parts. One of the best programs that I've seen in a long, long time. Check it out. Um, all of Hillary's concerns that you've expressed today have been spoken off in that. And 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 it's it's worth um, having that uh, perspective. Sorry, I didn't mean I to take that. Yeah, I think that's good, Sri, right? I mean, to Hillary's point, it's all about using data responsibly. And then to your point, right, making sure that we think about privacy as a core uh, component of this. All right, let's get into our fourth topic, which is cloud. You guys heard of this thing called the cloud? Um, clearly, in 2020, we saw, I mean, huge adoption of the cloud, right? People accelerating their journey into the cloud. You know, will this continue in 2021? Cheryl, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, for for us and our customers, what we're finding is that sometimes it would take us months to spin up a project, right? Just to, you know, get the data scientists, the data engineers together, where co-located with the data and getting access to to the data. And that's just something we can spin up so quickly now. And so I just think with the need for experimentation and, um, you know, uh, the scientific method requires that sort of agility. And I, I just can't say enough how that's uh, changed our our business to be able to like to, to, to virtually be operating right next to our customers with some of these experiments that we're doing. So that's really been a, a tremendous uh, plus for us. Yeah, so rapid, rapid provisioning, rapid spin up. You know, I think a lot of people are also looking at innovation, uh, you know, in the cloud as a core construct. You know, Bonnie, you've, you've given a prediction that there's some core things that, you know, companies need to think about in the cloud, you know, dynamic resource allocation and governance and MDM. Do you wanna make any comments about that and that, what that means for people in the cloud in 2021? Right, well, if you can spin things up quickly, which we do all the time when we deploy in the cloud, um, you also need to spin things up that are working within your master data management, within your data governance, that has the security protocols in place that you need to have. Because you can spin things up fast and because you can get them into production quickly, you can also create problems for yourself really quickly if you haven't paid attention to all those things that you had when you were paying, when you were putting them into operation outside of being in the cloud. So I just think all of those areas are ones in which people are going to come to a very firm realization. And as I say, the best in breed implementers are doing this already. They're implementing it in the cloud with security, with data governance. You know, we see this, we see this idea about agility versus wild, wild <laughs> west, right? So how can we get the, the best of both worlds and how it, how it comes together? You know, one of the things that's often discussed, uh, in fact, I was talking to Donald uh, Feinberg about this at Gartner, you know, there's hybrid cloud, there's multi-cloud, there's intra-cloud, there's, you know, just 100% public cloud, I mean, what do all these different architectures, how do those become important in 2021? Any thoughts on that one, Hillary? Yeah, so I mean, I think, and back back to this notion of wild, wild west, um, you know, uh, the pendulum is definitely swinging further and all of those flavors and varieties that you just talked about um, is is a reaction to what historically has been, I think Sri mentioned, like this very tight knit group of people, only you have access to the data. It's a very isolated set of data scientists um, running you know, the helm of the business. And now we have citizen data scientists running everywhere, kids just out of school, access to the keys to the kingdom, making business, what they believe are database decisions, but perhaps without the same level of expertise. And so they're reliant on tools, doing more of that expertise work for them, which is great enter AI and natural language processing and um, machine learning, right? Um, but at the same time, as we see more and more um, uh, siloization of data um, into cloud, sort of slices of data being moved into sandbox environments, what the natural reaction is, and we've seen this for, for years and years and years, is the pendulum's gonna come back. The pendulum, you're going to see um, security breaches, you're gonna see lack of data governance, you're gonna see poor decisions made by enterprise customers who have um, you know, lost track of the balance that you just referenced between agility and governance, security, privacy, um, and, and corporate responsibility. And so I believe that 
you know, perhaps 2021 will still begin, you know, still see more of this um, disaggregation and Wild West behavior, but very quickly, you always get a smack to the face that is a strong counteraction to that over um, overaction. And so I believe data governance, privacy, security um, will will be home to roost, and um, and we're seeing that in, in some situations already, uh, where um, our customers are very focused on um, perhaps reining in some of that um, splintering of, of data. Still moving to cloud, totally in it to win it on the cloud. I believe that there's lots of goodness that comes from cloud, but with sort of an adult at the table that is going to manage um, through those data governance, privacy, and security um, issues that are paramount for um, enterprise case customers. Thanks. No, I think that's a great that's a great point, Hillary. And I think um, you know throughout this panel, we've certainly we've touched on COVID, we've touched on uh, AI, we've certainly talked about uh, data and analytics. We've also really talked about cloud. And absolutely, people are moving to the cloud to drive more agility, more flexibility. You know, to get innovation uh, within the cloud environment. But let's move into our rapid fire section. So I'm going to give each of you. Nobody can comment on each other's comments, but you know, so you can, if you don't like what somebody says, you can't stop them. Just rapid fire, one prediction that we didn't cover in a statement that you wanna make. Let's start with you, Shri. Um, I'm gonna defy you and say two things. Um, <laughs> um, number one, I think we covered a little bit of this, which is there's gonna be significant enhancements in cybersecurity capabilities. I mean, most more of us are working at home. And more importantly, uh, if you looked at the the news, there's a lot of hacking going on of data systems and so on. So I think cybersecurity is going to be at a uh, premium. The number two, sorry, quick prediction. Okay, so cybersecurity. Car- okay, sorry, go ahead. Number two. <laughs> that was a good one. Um, smart cars and driverless vehicles. We're going to see more and more and more of that coming into the mainstream. All right, cool. So cyber and smart cars. Uh, Absolutely. You know, for years, we've talked about velocity, uh, variety, volume, veracity, the Vs for big data and all that kind of stuff. But I think that in the new environment, all of this is just going to be an exponential number of new, much more important KPIs. So if you're not thinking about your workload mix or analytic currency or your analytic complexity or your data sophistication or your analytic and modeling response times, in addition to things like data latency and data volume, then you're missing what I think the best are gonna be measuring themselves against in the future. All right, so make sure you measure against all the key KPIs to drive against uh, governance. All right, Cheryl, are you back on with us? Yes, I am. And I, you're not gonna believe what I'm gonna say. And it's gonna be the dark horse is gaming engines are gonna come out as being big because they will generate all that data behind simulated scenarios. When we can't be there, we're gonna create live action movies so that we can plant our ground truth in and model against that. And, uh, and it's not going to be, it's not going to be quantum computing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no quantum computing and gaming uh, technologies are going to drive it. All right. Last but not least, Hillary, what's your uh, prediction that we didn't cover? Yeah. So it's uh, resiliency, disaster recovery, and growth. And I'm not talking about IT or computers. I'm talking about humans. I'm incredibly optimistic that despite all that we've seen in 2020 and like ready to ready to move on to 2021, that as a society we will we are still better off than we were decades and decades ago. Um, people can work from home. Working moms can work from home and balance all the stuff that's going on. Um, and we have more access we have uh, to information um, and to education. Um, we have more rights as any society, all societies, not just in the US. Um, and this is gonna continue. And data and analytics in the cloud will provide a better place for humans to do the work that they need to do in 2021 and beyond. And I'm, I'm optimistic, actually, despite all of the uh, the rough edges that 2020 has had. Yeah, all the craziness. We really have a, a bright future in 2021. So I want to say thank you to uh, all of you. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you, Shri. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Cheryl. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, we look forward to all of your predictions uh, coming true in 2021. And I hope everybody just has a fantastic day and a great 2021. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.